Awesome. Thank you so much for everyone that is tuning in right now to Manny's Super Civic Cyber Conversations, the beginning of the day. It is Wednesday, April 22nd, and I want to thank you all for tuning in. Two quick notes. One is going to be a 30-minute long conversation, 20 minutes of Director Raphael and I speaking, 10 minutes for you guys to ask your questions. If you have questions for Director Raphael, you can type them into the Q&A box at any time. You don't have to wait uh, for them, and we'll we'll uh, do the, we'll pick them up at the end. If you also want to tag us, you can do it. It's all on the internet these days. We're asking people to share these things, so you can tag us at Welcome to Manny's. That's our tag. All right, let's get right into it. Debbie, how you doing? Where are you well, right now? Well, right now I am at the Emergency Operations Center in Moscone South. I am sort of outdoors, indoors in this hallway where I'm trying to find a quiet spot, uh, and I. I'm taking a little bit of a break from my uh, different hat, which is helping the city with its COVID-19 response to talk about what I really love, which is the environment and Earth Day. Got it. Well, first of all, happy Earth Day to you. How and you indeed. How have you been celebrating this Earth Day? Well, I think like everyone's celebration, it's really transitioned from taking it to the streets to taking it indoors. And we've been engaging people on our website, trying to bring people in, so to speak, uh, virtually to take action in their homes, take action uh, with their own person, and really appreciate nature all around them. Yeah. Well, um, I watched the Joe Biden, Al Gore, Climate Town Hall, and I know we're not supposed to get too partisan here, but it was nice to actually hear some people talk about climate change like it was a real thing and we needed to actually work on it. Let's talk about climate change. Let's talk about Climate Action Month, which we're in. What are some yeah. things that people can actually do from their home or during shelter in place to help further the cause of, uh, climate, of, the climate, of climate Action Month? Yeah, well, if anyone is curious and wondering what they can do, the simplest thing to do right now is to get on our website, which is sfenvironment.org because we have a whole Climate Action Month uh, page ready to tell you all and connect you to so many different things you can do. But for me, what this COVID experience is, this shelter in place, is it's a, it's a chance to look internally and ask ourselves individually, what is within our power? Rather than feeling powerless, let's figure out what each of us can do in our own homes. So for example, one thing I would love everyone to do is Take a look at that garbage bin in your kitchen and do your own waste audit. You know, what's in that bin? Are there things that really should be in recycling and composting? I challenge you, Manny, go get your garbage can. <laughs> Let's take a look what you got in there. I, mean, I can't see. Okay, so I've got a question. Egg okay. Is this egg cartons. Not supposed to go in the, um, I get the fancy eggs. Are this not supposed to go into the trash? That is a beautiful piece of paper. And that paper, because it's dry, should go into the blue bin. Now that's a great example because if, let's say you had that and it was full of cracked eggs. No, like I the put, eggs just broke, right? No, I put the eggs in the compost bin, my compost. But you would also put that container in the compost bin if it was all messy with broken eggs. But since it's, open it up, let us see. Is it nice, clean, and dry in there? Kind of. I have a little, there's one, this is so embarrassing. It is, there's one little egg on the corner. Oh. I had to get some egg whites for a cake I made, and then it, it just kind of congealed. So now what do so, I do? That goes in the green bin then, because we do not want that egg in our blue bin. So you could tear it up, up and half. Do you really want it to do it? Oops, my nose just blew away. One sec. <laughs> yeah, this is one of those live action things when you're outside. Debbie's, Debbie is over this conversation. She's not. <laughs> no, She's so, not there, so do, a, do a waste audit. That's one thing you can do. Another thing you can do is really make some commitments to yourself. Let's not waste food. Let's not waste things. Let's reduce our footprint on the planet. Let's eat a plant-based diet, but let's make sure that we don't let anything rot in our refrigerator. Let's use this time to get really creative with what's in our cabinets so we don't have food waste. 
because that food waste has a huge climate impact, as does putting things in the wrong bin. Another thing I would love everyone to do is figure out what you can do to reduce your energy and not only turn off lights, but see about buying 100% renewable energy, clean power SF. There's so many ways in San Francisco we can be environmentalists at home. So thank you for that. And the website, for those of you who, don't, who ha did not memorize everything that Director <laughs> Rafael just said, you can go to the chat box right now, and sfenvironment.org is in the chat box. You can just click on it directly. All right, let's talk about how COVID-19 is affecting the environment. What have you seen yeah. uh, in terms of how it has affected the environment right now? And what is your prediction on how it might affect the environment in the future? Well, I think COVID-19 is actually quite nature's lesson to us right now. I feel like uh, Mother Nature is telling us all that we need a time out and we need to go to our room and really think about what it is we've done to this planet. And when we do look around, what we see from COVID is both a blessing and a curse. And I think some of the good things that have come out of COVID for the environment is clearly the air is a lot cleaner. We're not in our cars. Right. Another great thing that came out of it is that people are now so much more connected to their communities that they're aware of their parks and they're aware of the birds that are coming into their neighborhood. And they're starting to appreciate biodiversity and the importance of green space. And another really wonderful benefit for the environment, frankly, is our connectedness to each other. That this pandemic has forced us to understand that we are connected to our neighbors and we are connected to our planet inextricably. Some of the downsides, I would say, is this issue of inequity. The inequities of the pandemic, who is exposed, who is suffering, yeah. is so clearly linked to our vulnerable populations. And it's those same populations that are affected by climate change. It's those same neighborhoods in San Francisco that are most impacted by heat impacts, that are most impacted when we have flooding, that are most impacted by um, sea level rise. So all of us are very aware that our connection is critical for our survival. And it's also part of the reason that we are responsible for our planet and that it's our actions that make a difference. Vice President Gore today seemed very optimistic that this actually could be a watershed moment for the fight against climate change. Um, there are also a lot of people saying that, you know, there's this eagerness to return to the normal we had before. Do you yeah. think, what do you think is going to happen? Do you think that this is actually going to um, represent a shift in our thinking around our relationship to climate, or do you think we're, it's going to go back to the way and we're going to have the same kinds of behaviors? Well, I think that's up to each of us to answer that for ourselves. Um, it is my hope that this sense of connection, this sense of being a part of something bigger than ourselves that we're seeing by in our own neighborhood, starting at that level, to the whole state and to the country and to the globe, and that interconnectedness will stimulate us to take action. I believe that is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I also believe that what we're seeing some now is a little bit of heartburn on our residents because we're actually asking them in abundance of caution to do things they know that aren't good for the environment. So we're saying, don't bring your bag to the grocery store, even though, frankly, you know, is a reusable bag really going to cause COVID to go and go around? We don't know. So an abundance of caution right now, we're saying, don't bring your reusable bag. We're saying, don't bring your reusable mug. And then I even heard Jeff Tumlin, the head of the MTA, say, don't get on Muni. I mean, those are crazy words that we're saying. But I believe that in San Francisco, we have tremendous muscle memory for environment, that there are things that are habits that are so ingrained in us that once we are back to normal, whatever normal is, those actions will spring back into place pretty quickly and pretty well. I'm not so worried about that. What I'm more curious about is can we take that muscle memory for the small thing and amplify it to scale? Can we figure out a way to take that connection, that partnership, that helping each other to be better than we are as individuals? Can we take that to heal the planet? I believe we can. How does San Francisco lead in that effort? I mean, it, some people are saying, 
we led in the effort to shelter in place. We were one of the first to do it, and it's worked well for our city. How do we lead uh, in the effort to create a friendship in how we think about our environment and return to the muscle memory of the actions we were taking before? Yeah, we lead because we care deeply as a city. We are a city that is not afraid to take risks. We've seen that over and over again. We saw that with the mayor coming out right in front and saying, you know what? I know it's a risk to some people, but I believe this is what we must do. We've said that and we've demonstrated that in so many ways by starting with something as simple as banning a plastic bag, right? Why? That seems so small, but it, it amplified. We've done it in the fight for clean energy. We have the cleanest electricity in San Francisco than anywhere in the country. We have so many ways of getting to 100% renewable electricity. We're working on legislation right now to ban natural gas in our new buildings. We're looking at our existing buildings and asking how can we make them the zero emission buildings of the future. And of course, there's our investments in transportation. We're so proud of all the public transit we have, our zero waste efforts. And finally, the way we look at nature here in San Francisco. San Francisco is one of the first cities to have every resident within a 10 minute walk of a park. We have a commitment to nature. And I would just like to say to everyone, one of the ways you now can show your commitment to nature is by using that green bin religiously. Make sure that every piece of food goes into that green bin because when you do, we're talking scale here. When you put your, your green bin, when you put that egg in that uh, egg carton in I your green bin. I promise you, I promise you, I'm going to put that in the green bin. Because when you do, Rectology picks it up. They take it to a compost facility. It becomes compost, which goes back on agriculture. Those agriculture creates products, perhaps for chickens, for wine, comes back to our city for a beautiful circular economy. So when we look at our, our hope for the future and how San Francisco leads, we create opportunities for this circularity. We create opportunities for people to make it easy for them to do the right thing. And I know we'll continue to lead in that fashion. Okay, tell, let's talk about zero waste and emissions for a second, because I know it's something okay. that the Department of the Environment has been working really hard on. It, you know, when we get there, that we will all be very proud of. So has um, the pandemic and the crisis affected the timeline to getting to zero waste and zero emissions? Um, and if so, how? That's a great question. And this is where San Francisco continues to lead. There are other cities across California and across the, the U.S. that have given up on recycling and composting. They're saying, you know what? We can't do it safely. We can't do it. Frankly, I think it's a little bit of an excuse because we have Recology who says we can do it. We will do it. We will make sure our employees are safe. So every time we use our green and our blue bins now, they're still getting bailed. They're still moving out. The compost is still doing its job in agriculture. So from a zero waste standpoint, it's, it's a little bit of a, of, a, of a hold on things like our reusable work. So we're going to need to really redouble on that. But it shouldn't get in the way of us reaching our zero waste goals. The other climate goals we have, we can't afford for them to slow down. This is a foreshadowing of what happens when we don't care for our planet, when we don't work together. So can it slow us down? It can, but it mustn't. Do you, uh, just one more question on what's happening now. I mean, it does feel like the physical environment of San Francisco seems healthier. I mean, just the fact that, I mean, it didn't feel like a pretty healthy city beforehand, but just being, being how many animals are out there and, um, you know, the parks and the air and all that. What do you think that does kind of from a resilience perspective to the city's physical makeup, you know, once this is over, that, like, that pause that we had? How do you think it affects the city's development long-term? Ah, well, I think it points out the importance of some of the things we've been saying for a long time, that people need housing, people need open space, and our streets, they need to be designed not just for cars, the curbs are not all about car storage. The curbs are there because people have access to them so that walking is more pleasant and biking is safer. These are things that I feel like we've been saying as a city, right. but now we can feel what that looks like. 
we can feel it and experience it ourselves when we're outside walking and social distancing. We're not worried about getting run over by somebody making a right turn, or we're just enjoying the fact that our neighborhood is quieter, and it's, and it's good for the soul. So I think that what this pandemic does is it allows us a chance to almost go back in time and to envision what the city can look like when we're not so overrun by things like cars and traffic. I mean, all the, the trappings right. of, a vi of a busy city. Um, folks, if you have questions for a director, Debbie Raphael, the Department of the Environment, now is the time to type them into the Q&A box. I just have one or two more questions for you. Um, okay, I have to admit, I don't know a whole lot about Earth Day, and I bet that the, the, the people that are tuned in, there might be some people like me who think it's great that it's Earth Day, but don't know a whole lot about what it's about and where it came from. Can you just tell me what Earth Day is all about? Yeah, I mean, Earth Day, 50 years. That's kind of amazing. And so, as you could imagine, we were geared up for some really big celebrations. And I have to say, many people were geared up for some very big protests. Uh, I was expecting to spend today on the streets, frankly, with thousands of other people making a statement that, especially to our federal government, that we will not be silent, that we will not go backwards, that we are committed to making the change we need to. Now we look around and our streets are quiet, but Earth Day was a time where people said, you know, we've been protesting against the Vietnam War. We know what civil disobedience looks like. It's time we expand that lens beyond war, which frankly is a big lens in and of itself, to the planet, because the planet is in danger. We had publications like Silent Spring, so we knew the, the impact of pesticides. We were starting to see smog days really impacting people's ability to get out and enjoy their, their livelihood. So there was very much an understanding in 1970 that the earth was in crisis. And at the time, Earth Day seemed like a way to mobilize people and, and channel that anger, channel that commitment into action. And of mm -hmm. course, it's grown in 50 years. It is celebrated all over the country, but even all over the world. Um, and now it's become something where we think, oh, it's not enough. Of course it's not enough. One day is not enough. Every right. day is Earth Day. But having said that, I think having a day of the year where we all stop our busy lives and contemplate our connection to this planet is invaluable. So thank you, Manny, for allowing me to be part of your Earth Day celebration. Of course, I have this shirt that I have to show you. Can you see it? Yes, rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes needed in all aspects of society to prevent, what is the bottom line, prevent I can't see what we're preventing. Climate change? Climate it's catastrophe, of course. Ah, it yes. sounds very attractive. Well, and and so you know the thing is? I bought it from him and I love it. I love it too. It, it can be a little daunting when you see that statement. It can feel overwhelming. And I think the thing I would say is, yes, all that change is needed, but it starts right here. It starts with each of us as individuals. Absolutely. All right, let's get to some folks with these questions. Um, Brian and Joanna, of all the things we can do if, from home, how effective are carbon offsets? Ah, carbon offsets, that's a great question. And there's so much debate about carbon offsets. What is that? And like, that is. What is a carbon offset? So a carbon offset says, you know what? I, here's an example. Tree planting in San Francisco. We cannot, there's no way we can plant enough trees in San Francisco go to really absorb enough CO2 to make a difference. Doesn't mean we don't plant trees. There are many reasons to plant them, but we're not a forest ecosystem. We're a sand dune ecosystem. So what you could do is say, well, what if I, instead of planting a tree here, uh, I, I give money to plant trees somewhere else? Yeah. So what is important about carbon offsets is that they're real, that they're, it's called additional. You're not just giving money to someplace that would plant trees anyway. You're creating new forests. You're saving existing forests in the Amazon, for example. So it's really important for our carbon offsets, which are valid. They just need to be real. And the way they are real is that they're certified by third-party certifiers who say, yes, there is additionality. So it's, you know, it's not, to me, it's an and, not an or. 
you know, we do everything we can. And if we can, we help build a really strong, real offset market. Got it. Um, Alejandra asks, uh, how is the city going to foster a sense of safety around reusables and bring your own mugs and containers after shelter in place? That, yeah, you know, you know what? I could use some help on that. So if people have ideas, I would love to know. It, it kind of breaks my heart that people might be fearful of that because the science is not there showing that the – well, the science, there is science to show how long the virus lives on various surfaces. Um, but it's not living on cloth very long. So how do we, and, and really that question is so is beyond even reusable. How do we foster a sense of safety about being in the same room with one another? How do we foster a sense of safety of all being on a bus together? I don't know the answer, and I, and I think it's a really important question. So thank you for the question, and if you have thoughts, please let me know. I would love to know what you think about that. Okay. Hannah asks, um, how do we balance encouraging the use of eco-friendly options with their inaccessibility for many due to uh, price, a disability, or illness? It requires the use of disposables harder for more vulnerable populations. Also, how do I know which soft plastics can be recycled and which ones are trash? Okay, well, well there's a lot there. That's a lot of questions in that. So this yeah. idea of, you know, of equity, in a way, is what I would say, where if the environmentally preferable, if the safer, if the more green option is more expensive, then who are we fooling? We're, we're not really making that change, that deep change that your t-shirt is talking about. And that's why we have to set a baseline. And that's where, regu frankly, as a government person, I think that's where regulation comes in. That's where laws come in. So it's not legal to sell something that isn't safe or isn't good for the environment. That's really the only answer to that inequity of cost. All food should be without pesticide residue. All food should be healthy and local. All plastics and containers should be recyclable. All reuse items should be readily accessible. And it's up to all of us to make sure we put policies in place to see that forward. Yes. In terms of soft plastics, which ones are recyclable? So when you say a soft plastic, and this may be, so here's what I would say. There's a lot to that question that I don't want to go into all the details on. So what I would like you to do is go to our website at sfenvironment.org, and there is a place where you can ask questions. There's something called RecycleWare in you know, uh, sfrecycles.org, and you can ask questions about what goes where, uh, and we will get back to you on your specific question because the issue of soft plastics um, I'm not sure how soft you mean. If you mean plastic bags or if you mean flexible packaging. It's hard to answer. Manny, you're frozen to me. Uh oh. Oh no. Are we good? Grace, no worries. Oh, I, I hear you. Oh, I see Jupiter. Can you see me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Well, um, I am here to guide every one of you um, now that we are <laughs> here. Um, so we were in the Q&A portion, right, Debbie? Yep. Um, and for those of you that don't know me, um, I was operating this conversation. I am the events manager at Manny's, uh, and here I am to take over Manny's. Um, all right, Debbie, what was the last question that you answered? Uh, about soft plastics and inequities in getting green things, things that are green. Gotcha. Okay, um, so let's begin with um, Hannah. So um, Hannah had a wonderful question. Um, how do we balance um, encourage, encouraging use of eco-friendly options with their, oh, there's Manny. Hey, Manny, so um, I was just going over um, Hannah's question. Do you want to take over? Uh, whose question was it? Um, Hannah's. I don't see Hannah's question. I um, think it's it. Okay, so let's see. Can you see it now? It's in the Q and A. Yes. Yes. Awesome. Uh, oh, you were in the middle of answering. Oh, you you were basically done answering it, Debbie. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know what happened. Was that me or was that you? I think that was me. I think so, but 
but who knows? We don't need to point fingers. Yeah, no, that's not what this is about. Um, <laughs> the, the chat questions disappeared for me for some reason. Jupiter, do you okay. see, did you see any of the chat questions that were typed into chat? I think we probably have time for one more. Um, yes, I'm gonna put um, Hannah's question in the in the uh, chat box so you can see it yourself. We already we already asked Hannah's question. What about okay. um? Was there another question in the chat? If you typed in a question in the chat box and it didn't get asked answered, we can go ahead and type it in again. Sorry about that. Yes, we have another one from Kay. Um, following Hannah's, I am putting it in the chat box now. Got it. Oh yeah, that's a great one to end it on actually. How can we use this crisis as an opportunity for change for the environment and not go back to business as usual? I mean, that's, that's the question, right? That is the most important question, and it's something that I know I ask myself every day, and my team at the Department of the Environment asks themselves as well. You know, the, what a shame to waste an opportunity, waste a crisis as an opportunity. So for me, I personally am going to make sure that the environment, the questions of environment, are much more connected and deeper integrated all of our city conversations about health, I don't think that they were so much. Uh, this is an opportunity to really link our health and the environment in a very meaningful way. We've always been thinking about equity. We think about housing as a city. How do we bring all of that in with the environment as, as, a, as a whole? And that this opportunity is really, for me, it's all about connection. It's all about those lessons of those personal actions the whole emphasis of our uh, health orders have been on the personal action, what each of us needs to do. Do we wear a mask? Do we, um, do we social distance? Do we bring a bag? Do we not bring a bag? But it's all about us as individuals. And I want to take that, and we've done it. We've done it. Look around. We can do this as individuals. So what yes. I want to do is take that same sense of power of the individual and move it over to broaden to our planet, to our environment, to our connection, and all those ways we've connected with our neighbors by celebrating, singing on, on the corner, or bringing food to an elderly person, all the ways that we have gone out of our way, out of our little shell, uh, out of our business as usual, keep that, keep those beautiful things, keep this vision of our city right now in its clean air, and make it our responsibility to keep those individual actions for the planet's sake mm. and don't take no we want we did not take no on this we should not take no no we say no to trump right we are not going to allow the federal government to roll us back we know the future we want and we're going to use our individual power to get there uh, Debbie, you're such an amazing leader, and I'm, we're so lucky in San Francisco to have you representing the Department of the Environment and fighting um, for our environment on this Earth Day and, and, and before this and in the future. Thank you for deploying your staff to support um, our uh, relief efforts and our uh, emergency response. I know a lot of your staff is working very hard. So thank you yeah, for I your got time. One. Yes, you look very official with that. <laughs> um, I, really, I, um, I appreciate you and I want to wish you a happy birthday. And just real quick for those who are tuned in, sorry for being jumped off. I want to point everyone to joinit.org slash o slash manus. And if the operator doesn't mind putting the link in the chat box as well, it's the link to become a sponsor to Manny's, my small business. Um, we're having a tough time right now. We're worried we may not be able to make it through this long and slow recovery. The way we'll be able to do it is if we get the community to join us in becoming sponsors. It's $36 a month and it goes to supporting my business and keeping it open. So please consider becoming a sponsor. It's joinit.org slash o slash manus. Thank you to Jupiter um, for uh, running this call. And I'm sorry again that my internet cut out and to Ram and Sam as well. And most of all, I want to thank uh, Director Debbie Raphael and the entire San Francisco Department of the Environment for fighting the good fight on behalf of our city. So thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Manny. And happy Earth Day, everyone. Happy Earth Day, everyone. Happy 50th anniversary. <laughs>